All right, uh, I'm going to call the Thursday, April 7th meeting of our Borough Council to order. Uh, Ms. Bryant, we call the roll. Sure. Council President Frederick Bush. Here. Council Vice President Michelle Panopoulos. Council Member Barbara Fortner. Here. Council hmm. Member Rob McGrady. Here. Council Member Cindy Rickards. Here. Council Member Bob Weisberg. Here. Council Member Ira Winston. Here. Mayor Andrea Deutsch. Here. All right. Uh, are there any changes or additions to the agenda? Seeing none, uh, my comments are that it's very wet out there, so be very careful. Uh, we're seeing really uh, strong flow of water right here on Haverford Avenue. Uh, not sure where else. So if you're seeing this live right now, uh, if in an area that you know could be flooded, uh, take care. Ms. Deutsch, <laughs> I probably stole your, your comments, but do you have comments? Um, no, no, actually that was fine. Um, I just want to remind everyone, we have a number of events coming up on Saturday uh, from 9 to 11. Um, uh, uh, Mary Jo Daly, our, our rep, uh, house rep, state house rep, is having a free shredding event from 9 to 11 at uh, the Municipal Courthouse on Montgomery Avenue. Uh, but before that, <clears throat> uh, we're having the Norbeth Run. Uh, the annual uh, cystic fibrosis Narbeth run. So uh, in, in preparation for that, the sh all the streets in Narbeth will be closed from 7.30 a.m. to approximately 9.30 a.m. So um, it's an annual event for two hours. Uh, if, if you want to, it'd be great to have everyone participate in the run or walk. But if you have to get out of the borough between those times, you're advised to park outside the limit of the of the route uh, so that it doesn't become a problem. Um, and that's it. All right, thank you, Mayor Deutsch. Uh, let's move on to public comment. Uh, does anyone in the room wish to make a public comment? Let's see, none. Let's move on to our uh, all right, so I think everyone here online knows how we usually do this. If you either literally raise your hand or do the raise hand on Zoom, I will call on you and then you can unmute and provide your comment. All right, uh, Carol Marie, looks like you're the first person with your hand up. Good evening, everybody. Um, before I begin public comment, I'd just like to ask that Fred, oftentimes when someone's giving you a public comment, it seems that you're watching your timer rather than really listening to what they're saying. And I just like to let you know that it's it's appreciated to know that that uh, council is really listening to what we have to say. Um, for my public comment, though, I would like to say that uh, Friends of Sabine Park supports the Narberth Community Food Bank's proposal with the Montgomery County Rescue Plan for the 201 property that um, shrinks the parking lot and doubles the size of the park. And Friends of Sabine Park through Miracle Play Systems has designed an inclusive park for our community. And we have given this plan to the Narber Food Bank plan. These two plans from the Food Bank and Friends of Sabine Park meld together beautifully and satisfy the goal of the health and safety and well-being of every Narber citizen with, with an inclusionary and adaptive new park and an adult exercise station. While we support the food bank's plan to increase the size of the park and include the adaptive equipment, if council cannot come with an agreement to the food bank, we insist that 201 become a park with an inclusive playground from corner to corner. We can share the amazing plan that we have uh, for uh, the playground with borough council. I just want you to know that residents of Narberth do not want a development on Sabine Park. We do not want to fund a daycare center with market rate housing as been discussed on Sabine Park. Residents really want to park in open space, especially with the new apartments, 150 new apartments that are being built. Now, at Tuesday's meeting regarding the acquiring of the three Elmwood for open space and stormwater management, during the meeting uh, on record, Michelle was talking about the importance of open space and Bob said there's a balance between the need for development versus open space and this will be our first opportunity to preserve open space. I ask each of these council members, what about Friends of Sabine Parks and the public's multiple requests for years for open space protection on both of our current parks? 
you have a resolution or 201, but it's only a piece of paper that says there will be open space at Sabine. This paper does nothing for permanent open space protection for our park. It does nothing to guarantee our parks an open space that keep it from any development. Uh, we want to know why you haven't addressed this very important issue that benefits all of Narberth now and for the future. You're jumping on spending 1.1 million on a property for open space, but really listen to yourselves. You're buying open land, spending this money on this, but you're not willing to put a permanent preservation on our current parks. It's unfathomable but why we want to buy more property. I agree. More property is great, open space, but we're not going, we want open space protection on all of Narberth parks. We do not want. So my comment is, please put open space protection, permanent open space protection on all of our parks, because this is our future. We don't want to be short sighted. We want our future guaranteed for our kids and for the future of Narberth. All right, thank you. Um, I do want to say, uh, with regards to the, uh, the potential purchase uh, at Three Elmwood, that the borough's uh, share of any purchase uh, would be 550000 We are applying for this grant uh, to get matching funds for the state uh, for the rest of the money that would be spent to uh, acquire the property. Uh, just wanted to get that lower number out there. And with regards to the um, proposed plan uh, from the food bank. It has not been presented to uh, Borough Council. And we understand that the deadline for this uh, funding opportunity uh, is fast approaching. So uh, we look forward to hearing about uh, this proposal in more detail uh, if it is something that uh, is planned to be submitted. Now, hasn't this plan been submitted to uh, Samantha? No, we haven't seen any, and we have not seen any details of this plan. We've uh, merely heard some discussion about it, you know, similar to, um, and people have talked about it, but we have yet to actually be presented with it in a form that we can approve or even discuss. So uh, time is uh, passing very quickly on the deadline for this. So while we are receptive to um, proposals from the food bank, of course, we need time to consider anything uh, before we can <laughs> proceed further. We need to see this. All right, that's uh, that's all I have to say about that for now. Thank you for your comment, uh, Carol. Thank you. All right, and does anyone else wish to make a public comment here on Zoom tonight? All right, uh, I don't see any other hands raised on Zoom. So I'll note that um, in addition to the public packet, there was a letter submitted uh, from Mr. Lawrence Goldberg that's been posted to the borough website along with the packet, uh, expressing uh, comments about 201 Sabine and the importance of open space on that property. All right, uh, thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, let's move to the first item on the agenda. Okay. Uh, actually, Todd, if you wish to make any public comment, we're about to close public comment, so all right then. Uh, first item uh, is the public art proposal. Just to give some context to that? Yeah. And then, uh, and, and Scott is here, so that we can ask him to step in. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Scott Lewis, who you may have seen his photos or seen him present actually at community events over the years, who has, who has captured kind of the essence and spirit of Narber in both the people and the events and the places, um, contacted me to see if there would be any interest in perhaps a public art proposal kind of to celebrate the revival of community events um, here, here in Narber. Uh, I personally felt like it was a fabulous time to remind Narberth that the essence of Narberth is in fact its people. <laughs> and despite a lot of change, which is always really scary, um, some nice public arts and reminders of who we are as a community uh, is just really well timed. Um, so I asked Scott if he could put together something more, a bit more concrete um, and bring it to council. So he did what I think is a, a pretty um, 
uh, he overestimated on, on some of the, the financial tags that he gave, which I appreciate, Scott, uh, and, and did some real examples of what he was envisioning um, to see you know, where we could strategically place these um, beautiful kind of photo documentaries of Narborough uh, throughout the parks and, and businesses. Um, and, and Scott, if I can maybe turn it over to you then, and if we can share some of those pictures, maybe you can talk us through that proposal. Um, sure. I'd be happy to. Uh, thanks for giving me a chance to talk about it. Um, yeah, this did come together a little bit quickly. Um, I, when I saw the, uh, that the fireworks were back on, I thought this would be a great time to start a conversation about doing this. Um, there's a large range of possibilities of how this can end up. So pricing is going to be dependent on what that actually looks like um, in terms of the number, the size, um, and that's to be determined. So I would see pricing as relative, um, but I can share my screen now, I think. Yeah. All right. Uh, give me one second. Uh, hold on one second. This is not, hang on, I'm going to stop sharing here for a second. There's some interference between what I'm trying to do and Sorry, the computer is locked up. I think Samantha might be able to share because it's in our packet. Yeah, we, we can share from this end, Scott. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, let me um, yeah, I'll get that up there, please. Yeah, I'm going to So Scott, just uh, you know, Thanks. tell me where you want me to go with the you know scrolling up and down or anything, and I'm happy to. Sure. Do that. No problem. Um, yeah, so this is a small a sample of, of the work. There's right now upwards of about 60 or so images um, that I've got in my current edit. Um, my goal with this project is to produce it as a book. And I'm looking at right the spring is kind of the final stage of uh, the, the last images to be done. Um, so this is just sort of an example of the feel of, of some of the images. Okay, you can go next. Um, this is um, work done by a friend of mine um, in, uh, this is done in the Boston area as well as in Atlanta. Um, this is a larger scale than I would envision, but this is um, a little bit of my inspiration for doing it. Um, she did these two projects um, as a way of creating a dialogue throughout her community um, uh, to celebrate immigrant histories in both of these different places. Uh, and I think it was, it was a tremendously successful event in Massachusetts. And then she was brought to um, a suburb outside of Atlanta to do the same idea. Um, so it just kind of gives you what a finished version of it could look like in some sense. Okay. So I uh, rode my bike around town and kind of plotted out potential locations. By no means am I thinking that it could be all of this. It's just these are places that I thought could be a great host of sorts for images. So that could be, you know, the fence that goes all the way around the park, the um, fences in between the tennis and basketball courts um, here. Um, yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, so these are just sort of I, places that I could envision images going um, and the different sizes um, here, for example, is, you know, where the Ricklands was on the left. Um, this construction fencing going around these two locations, it could be a way to break up that monotonous green that, that's just kind of there with some images from around the community. Um, there's, you, you could even potentially put it on the side of the building here that holds the um, state store. Um, and, you know, I took this as an, another idea of potential locations. I know the borough doesn't control every piece of this here, but it was just giving a scope of what it could look like in this immediate downtown area um, of different locations. Um, and then this were, these were buildings um, that I thought, and kind of trying to give a little bit of a look as to what it could potentially look like. Um, some quick little Photoshop in there. Um, my daughter does have dibs on being above the cheese shop. 
<laughs> she asked since she loves cheese and actually the picture of her was where the whole project began um uh but just to sort of put you in the mindset of you know what that could look like just a few examples of that and just uh for some some context too prior to the pandemic we had a meeting with um bob keegan and tim Wood and the nba and actually the nba had asked in our art hey could could we perhaps put some art, some signs around the construction fence, which everyone was really amenable to. Um, and we did loop back to Mr. Rubin to say, is that something you would be, even be open to if this project were to continue? And, and he was. So uh, there was a discussion about this in, in 2019 of ways to kind of beautify some of the change in the construction. And actually, I had spoken with him about chewing some pictures inside Rickland's before they tore it down and i was all set to start figuring that out on about march 10th last year uh, at the beginning of the pandemic oh, yeah it kind of <laughs> it was a little tragic um so yeah and then here um i i worked I, I reached out to a printer that i've used in the past to get some ballpark pricing on sizes so this would be you know 24 foot banners 10 six foot banners um, just as a, again, a ballpark idea of what that would look like. Um, uh, so 37 is a lot, um, but I thought let's just kind of cast a big net and then we can, if we got to that phase, we'd get to literally mapping it out. Um, what image will go where, how big and really dialing that in. Um, and the curation, uh, that's a, I don't know why that's showing the 20 foot banner there. Um, that's, that's a typo. Um, but that would be, you know, uh, I've never done an outdoor installation. So I thought I'd need to sort of rope somebody in to help put that together and just ballpark the cost for that. And then again, for installation, I'm thinking we might be new cherry pickers. And um, I kind of presume to absorb all of this in the proposal. And then Cindy has sort of shed some light on, other ways to do that that could be fantastic so um not to put todd bressy on the spot because he's so often in the hot seat in these meetings but um, when i did see that proposal i had said we actually have an expert in our community of public art and curation you know perhaps we could ask mr bressy to get again volunteer his time and help uh, reduce the budget with that 2500 curation cost which we have not asked him yet so um, i certainly wouldn't want to do that publicly he could have this knowledge. Uh, Public Works does have a heavy load, so I think keeping that thousand dollars in for installation probably sounds um, wise. But I think more accurately, that number is more at the top end, around forty-seven hundred. Wouldn't you say, Scott? I mean, that's with thirty-seven signs printed. Yeah, yeah, that thirty-seven is a lot. But I thought, you know, it was a fair place to leave it for a high end of a budget. Yeah. Uh, how about securing permission from uh, building owners and things? Is this something you would propose to do? Or you would expect the borough to do? Or would you? Um, no, I'd be more than happy to do that. I think that it makes, frankly, more sense for me to do that because it's my work and there's a conversation. I think when I, I'm happy to kind of talk about it. Um, so I'd have no problem doing that. And Scott, how do you get permission from the people, you know, before you put their photo on the side of the building or a fence? Yeah. That's something you would handle as the artist, I'm assuming? Um, I'm sorry, say that again? That's something you would handle as the, the artist here? Yeah. And everyone that I've photographed, um, I have told them what my goals are with it as a, as a book project and a, a potential exhibit like this. So everyone that I photographed has heard me say that this is a possibility but i for sure would loop back with people before i would put their picture up because as much as someone may be fine with it being on a page of a book they might not be okay with a 10-foot image of their face on the side of a building and i respect that <laughs> so what's the expected lifetime of these installations uh as far as I was, that's an open conversation. I wouldn't think more than a few weeks, but. Oh, I wasn't sure if it was permanent or temporary. That's what I was. That was oh, 
I was envisioning temporary. Um, I think that, that might be a lot for people to have a permanent thing. Um, that wasn't my vision, but. Well, yeah, that, that just, that just uh, pre prevents my next question, which is how do you maintain it? But you don't, you take it yeah. down. Yeah, about, about how long does it take? Sorry, I thought that you were no, here. My question's been asked. Okay, about how long does it, does it take before these show significant weathering? Uh, I think it would be quite a while. I mean, I, you know, these are banners that you would see on any kind of outdoor installation, uh, banners that, you know, that are used. They're pretty durable. They're going to last for quite a while. Um, I don't, I don't envision that in the time they'd be up that they'd start to fade or change any significantly. So, so my question is, what are they made of and can they be reused or do they just become landfill when this is done? Um, they're made of vinyl. Um, they could be, I mean, I don't, they could be reused. Um, not like you couldn't reprint on the vinyl. Like you couldn't wash off the image and then reuse the vinyl itself. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't personally, I wouldn't want to throw them away, but yeah, I mean, there would, they would kind of be something put into, you know, a, a storage of some kind. Maybe, yeah. Be tarps or something for yeah. something. That, that's, I'm just yeah. th look, thinking yeah. about this. Project, this generates a big pile of something to be, disposed of at the end so i want us to think about that so um, that leads to the question scott of, of, of like who actually owns these so once they're printed their property the image obviously is belongs to you but yeah. the, the material itself would be purchased would be a, 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 an expense of the borough would the borough then own them those objects or would they still belong to you um i think that's something we could discuss um yeah, I, I have actually started some research on potential grant funding for it, but you know, I think that that's something that we can discuss. Any other questions for, uh, for Scott? All right. Um, Fred, thanks, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Andrea. Um, uh, would there be a possibility of, uh, I don't know, auctioning part of these off? Although that could be kind of weird to have, like, an image. <laughs> I'd, be, I, I'd be open to it, sure. Well, I should say selfishly, there's a picture of my proudest moment as the dog pageant MC that I've often yeah. told my family is going to be my funeral picture. So, I, so I'll volunteer to bid on that one. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think there are ways if you've ever been to even Barcelona actually takes their signs down and makes them into bags and sells them. I think there are actually a lot of examples where we could use the artists in the town to do something really creative. I think an auction is a fabulous idea. I think people would actually buy a 20 foot banner of Paul from the family. Like, you, you know, I, I think that there are ways that we could absolutely commit to having them preserved, even if just in Friends of Narvard history. All right. Uh, yeah, for sure. I guess it's a minute anyway. Okay, so uh, let's discuss among ourselves for a bit. Okay, thank you, Scott. And if we have other questions, sure. we'll, we'll let you know. Okay, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. It's a chance. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Well, maybe you should all discuss, and then I would ask if we're in agreement how we would want to consider to find that for the forty-five hundred dollars in the budget. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's two questions. Do we like the idea, and then funding it? So. Sure. Maybe okay. We should just do it. Do it. Okay. Maybe we should just do a, a straw poll. People who you know are interested in, in pursuing this idea, you know, barring a funding conversation. Just raise your hands if you. All right. So let's uh, let's let's move to funding. <laughs> I, have a, I have a proposal. Okay. I'd like to see us fund the project through the sale of the banners, but through the sale of the artwork. So, so through so um. And if, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically the way, like, it's sort of like the town becomes a gallery. Mm -hmm. The borough's the, the parent, the borough's curating and uh, kind of the, the, creating the venue. I mean, in addition to the private property owners whose property the banners are going on to, and it seems to me that we could maybe reasonably anticipate um, being able to sell the work, and at least the like, sales of work could offset the, uh, the cost. So, I'm oh, sorry, Bob, so we would kind of would fund the money yeah. in the thoughts that we will recuperate some of that funding if, let's say, a grant doesn't go through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Anybody have thoughts? I don't have much. To... I'm just not convinced that that there's going to be buyers. If we did 37, that there would be buyers for that many because they're so big. Where would you put them if you bought one? You know, so that would be. I just would think we'd want to be thoughtful well, about I think that. Think you offset the cost. Yeah. You know, offset. You yeah. know, subsidize the, the final cost through the sales. But maybe not. All right. Maybe not make it all up. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Thank you. Some I, portion. I okay. Yeah, I'm fortunate because I, I, I just, I don't know that you're going to have that many people who are going to say, oh yeah, I want to buy that, and then I'm just going to fold it up and put it in my attic, you know, which could happen, but still. Well, I mean, ordinarily, Cindy, I would say maybe you should uh, get together with Scott and talk about uh, funding, and you'll come back to us uh, in a couple weeks. But I think you're, I may not be reasonable for you right now. Right? Uh, I am traveling. I do think. You know, I would I, I would like to say, you know, could we assign a dollar amount, and then that will give Scott guiding for again. He proposed thirty seven, and with the disclaimer, I don't really foresee us having to put up all thirty seven. You know, could council say we will allot uh, four thousand dollars towards this project? Uh, I do think it's timely, given it's we're kicking off event season. There's lots of Construction happening, so I'd hate to see us um, delay. You know, if, if Samantha could say I could find four thousand dollars on the budget, with the idea of we will try to recuperate that either through a grant or sales or, or whatever that may be, an auction, an auction, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, twenty-four foot banners. I think we'd be surprised at how many people would buy a banner. Um, of four feet. Yeah. 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 That, like, yeah no, I mean, yeah. that one I see, but the really big ones? Okay. Yeah, the 20 foot banner. Who knows? But you know, are, are we comfortable? <laughs> maybe if we could decide on a price that if we are in support to give to Scott, then I could continue to facilitate that if council is comfortable because I was very clear this was not going to fall on the office. All right. Samantha, do you have any thoughts about the. So <clears throat> the 4,000. Uh, bad news and good news. Bad news is the four thousand dollars wouldn't fit with any existing budget category. Uh, the good news is if council were to make an additional budget allocation for it, um, yeah, the borough could, could handle that. I would be a little skeptical of, and I, I'll admit I'm not an expert on this, of what grants might be out there for it, or the overhead required for that grant may not be worth the amount of money that you get for it, but. I certainly trust you know like you and Scott to figure that sort of thing out. Um, so if the borough had to front four thousand dollars for it, if council wanted to make that allocation, yeah, we we can handle that. All right, Barbara, right, you want to throw some cold water on us? Well, I just don't know when these would go up and how long they would stay up. So it's hard for me to judge the value of it without like fully understanding you know the time period. Uh, well, okay, Scott. So, how long? If we if we gave you the if we you know gave you the money and, and said go ahead, uh, how long would it take to set this up? Um, you know, it would it wouldn't take all that long. It's a couple weeks to get it printed. Once we decided on which images and what sizes, I would imagine it would be two to three weeks of a curation process to really dive in, analyze where we're going to put things, how many dial that in. So, you know, I'd say six weeks is probably a fair range of time to be able to comfortably put it together. I was thinking it would be great if it went up before the 4th of July, and then it was up through the 4th of July, like that month, I think would be, a, a, you know, a lot of bang for your buck. Um, yeah, Scott, so, it's funny. I, I envision more like six months. <laughs> yeah. Um, that it would be up or that it would take to no, no that it would be up okay and then it was, we have oh. like the bike ride coming up the concerts mm -hmm. in the park are all summer in our back um you know all the I'm, I'm fine with that i just didn't want to be so presumptuous as to you know wave my flag that boldly but if that's if there's an appetite for that i'd be more than happy to we can always plan it for a month and then see if we want to extend it at that point yeah all right. but i guess my hearing that all that i would say that it would need to be up for july 4th otherwise i just don't think it's because that's like a big event because yeah. we missed two years and it's like yeah. you know that's like that's that's a real uh, like uh you know milestone for the borough that, we, that that's coming back so if it can be up for july 4th then you know i guess i don't care how long it's up after that okay uh, cindy could you would you and scott coordinate with the nba to figure out like the yeah. I mean, because a lot of this, I think, would it, 
um, kind of draw people. That's that's part of the idea to draw people downtown oh, during construction, absolutely. unify the downtown. Sure. So Scott, I, I would envision us working with the NBA, possibly the NAA, the Narrowth Athletic Association. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about some of the fields. Um, you know, we, we could loop back to Mr. Rubin to see if we could follow up on what we had discussed with those construction fences. Uh, for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would. Again, I don't. I don't want to put this on the office or council. And I think once we come up with a budget that the borough is willing to contribute, Scott, that you and I can coordinate the rest. Hundred percent. I mean, I think another another possibility would be to see if people want to sponsor a photo yeah. on their yeah. space. That's you know, right. Yeah. That would be a way to. The developer. Yeah, then, then we know we got permission because they're, you know, we put their name somewhere. Yeah. 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 I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, too. that's a beautiful All right, yeah. well, let's see if we can make that work. Okay. Um, but, yeah. uh, so he wanted to, so he suggested that we commit to a, a $4,000 amount if, you know, if none of these other funding possibilities kind of, they all fall through. So, uh, okay, it looks yeah. like we're broadly in favor. Um, so let's move forward with the planning, and uh, okay. if we have more, we can. Yeah, so, it's um, yeah. so since you are talking about making a budget allocation, you do need a motion and a second and a vote on that. All right. Otherwise, the auditor will yell at me next year. Okay. <laughs> and I have a motion. You don't want that. Okay, we need a motion to uh, amend the budget to include four thousand dollars for a public art uh, display. Right. Can I say that to you? Sure. Um, I move that we amend the budget to allocate four thousand dollars to go towards a public art installation uh, curated and created by Scott Lewis. I'll second. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. All right. It's unanimous. Thank you, Cindy. Okay. All right. Thank and thank you, Scott. Too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next item, which is borough grant writing support. Samantha. Yeah, so I really uh, appreciate council taking time tonight to consider this request. As we've noticed over the past uh, four or five months here, the borough has had, uh, it's been grant season of sorts around the borough, and we've had numerous opportunities that we've been pursuing. And while I certainly, you know, trusted my skill set in it, and it was a big part of what I worked on um, prior to coming here, I think it's part of why, I like to think it's part of why I got hired here. Um, you know, it does take a certain amount of time commitment to really do these right. And I am very thankful for the support from members of council, community organizations, and some of our professional staff that we've gotten on these grant applications. However, I do think it could be a good um, return on investment of sorts for the borough to actually allocate funding to someone who we could consistently turn to for dedicated grant writing support. And I think if we had a model where I had someone who could, you know, do like, let's say 80% of the writing on it, and then I could like review and put like, you know, the borough sort of spin and knowledge on it and all that, that was a model that worked well for me in prior employment. I think it's a model that worked well for the borough. And I think for the amount that we'd have to spend for it, if we even got, you know, one or two extra grants, as a result of it, it would, you know, very quickly uh, pay for itself. Um, so I would be envisioning, you know, just council consider, I'd say something like 20000 I think we could pull that money from some of our existing engineering budget, some of our existing planning budget, and especially if we're through, like, the bulk of grants that I think we're really going to apply for this year. I think we can, um, you know, keep that cost somewhat minimal this year, and then for next year's budget, really budget for it. Um, so I just want to see what council thought about that, and if so, whether you would feel comfortable with me using my discretion to select that person, or if council would want to be involved in that decision. Uh, yeah, I, I would support that. I mean, you know, our managers already had experience with that model. It sounds very reasonable. The, the, the number of grants that you've already submitted is so impressive to me. And your ability to work with many different partners. So I have complete confidence you know, in your ability to manage the grant writing process. But there are only so many hours in the day. So yeah. I would support it. No, just second drop. I have nothing more to add. 
I would defer, but I would say I also don't think council needs to be involved in the choosing of who that is that we trust you. That's your expertise, not ours. Right. Agreed. Yep. All right. I see a lot of nods. So. Awesome. Well, Sounds thank good. you all very much. We'll try and go get some uh, more grant money for the borough. <laughs> all right. Lovely. That's exciting. Uh, next item is consideration of creation of police advisory committee coming out of public health and safety, but I think once again, Cindy, uh, <laughs> uh, or, or well, yeah. Yeah, I'll just start and Cindy can jump in. But this, this came through our committee and there's broad support within the committee from all three members plus uh, our mayor, plus the police chief and the manager. So we have discussed this at length and it's really been well vetted. And it's only at, the, at this point that we bring it to the full council for consideration. Um, the idea is really to organize a kind of research, research arm for the Public Health and Safety Committee so that our committee can request research on any number of topics and report back with recommendations. We imagine it would be uh, a quarterly meeting and um, with a very kind of targeted charge coming from our committee. Uh, of course, it would be advisory to the committee, but it would work in parallel to uh, the EAC, the way that that's been structured. Our work, public health and safety, I mean, we, we really rely on the EAC for their research and expertise, and um, we would welcome this kind of support as well on the police side. So, Cindy, do you want to say more about uh, um, sure, I mean, this is a model that actually many municipalities had. Um, most municipalities created some sort of um, civic advisory council or board, or board after um, the murder of George Floyd. So this is not um, anything new or progressive from our end. This is really just kind of mirroring a larger national dialogue on how policing and public safety um, are married in a community privileged like ours with such a low crime rate, you know, we really can be expansive about our approach to policing and public health. Um, so for example, our last budget, we added a budget line under public safety of the built environment. You know, this would be analogous to, as Rob's point, the EAC, where we can say, you know, talk about how our number one complaint of speed and traffic that typically goes to police, how can we ask you to research how you know crime prevention and traffic violations can be prevented through environmental design. That's a, the charge that our committee and council can give to this group to really workshop and give back to us. Uh, Mayor, was, oh, was Mayor Deutsch. Oh, and as the yeah. third member of the committee, yeah. oh, sorry, I forgot to come. <laughs> third member. As a third member of the committee, I would just add that um, in a general sense, we've watched over the last 12 years as the boards and commissions have become more important in the functioning of the council as advisory bodies that the council really has been responsive to. We've created several several new advisory boards over in recent years. And with as good as like our sort of little democratic experiment is within NARBA, it has gotten better and better and better as more residents have been involved. And I think it creates a much stronger um, social cultural cohesion within the borough. It used to exist actually primarily around the schools when when all Narbeth kids used to kind of attend the same school district. But when the district was divided into two school districts, it also derived to divide kind of the political body of Narbeth sort of into in two directions. And I think as we've created this these kinds of advisory commissions and boards and have really worked as a council to really honor and listen to their their direction, the direction of the community, we've, we've all gotten stronger and uh, volunteerism is really high. So I'm just really grateful that the community's been able to bring this this idea to the, this moment. <coughs> Thanks, Bob. Sorry to cut you off there. All right, uh, Mayor Deutsch? Uh, sure. Um, I think it's a great idea. This is a model that has been used in a number of different municipalities. Um, I think it gives it an opportunity for community input and more um, 
uh, a way the chief brought up. It's a way to really hear uh, more of community concerns and listen a little bit better to the co community. And he was very much in favor of it. Uh, I had made a suggestion that the committee be made up kind of similar to the HARB and that you have certain um, uh, specific roles that are member people of the committee who have certain specific roles, like a business member, of the com from the community, somebody from different areas, so that you can get a complete uh, understanding of, a, of an approach to a problem. Um, so I thought that that, that would be a, a, a smart way to approach it. So um, I think it's a, a, a valuable tool uh, and one which would be a nice addition to the borough. Thank you, Mayor Dorch. Uh, I, I would like either Rob or Cindy or Bob, whichever one would like to, to just speak to who the defined roles are on the committee because mm -hmm. I did not know what an ICA certified member was mm -hmm. and I was not aware of a Narberth Anti-Racism Committee. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'd like to know a little more about those. Yeah, ones. Barbara, and I'm sorry I didn't get back to you That's sooner okay. on that. I know I see you. But um, <laughs> yeah, I actually um, got the name wrong. It's the um, the Anti-Racism Coalition of Narberth. Okay. So it's a community organization. It's not oh, it's part a of the government. Okay. It's a community organization, and um, I believe Mona Alshax is part of that group, and there are other neighbors of ours <laughs> involved. Um, so we thought that it would be valuable to have mm -hmm. one member from that group. We also listed the business association mm -hmm. as one member, and then um, two additional members without a kind of divine, defined role. But then this ICA piece is something that Cindy has brought to us with her expertise, and, and you, you could speak to it. Cindy. Sure, so there's an international crime prevention through environmental design program that actually you can get some certifications and take some classes. Um, so we really thought perhaps it would behoove us to, to get one of the volunteers of this number to go through a workshop, get the certification, and then ultimately, you know, perhaps make a recommendation that Public Works or one of the officers also put that into their professional development to work in tangent. But we really think that this could be a valuable professional development tool, given the fact that we are, again, our number one kind of complaint is speed and traffic. Mm -hmm. um, we actually just looked at the regional data, and Narberth was was highlighted in this for our pop-up bike line. Mm -hmm. uh, but the evaluation is pretty darn clear that uh, rolling stop signs mm -hmm. and traffic speeds yeah. are best deterred by environmental design. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this this could be an org that, that could really, uh, could start the conversation mm -hmm. of more strategically using that approach in the borough. What does ICA stand for? Uh, the International Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design Association. Ooh, so, so <laughs> the, the pre ICA. Yeah, and I can. Um, there's, a foot, there's a footnote in the document that has a link to the. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I didn't even. I didn't thank notice you. that. I was scanning through it looking for ICA in parentheses with yeah. a you know like PHS was. I did not read that footnote. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. So, what if any overlap is there with this and the Civil Service Commission? Good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, I can ask. That? Yeah, sure. It, it, it's actually really pretty clear. The civil service hires the police and deals with any grievances. And in fact, we discussed that this new group's first charge could be researching police requirements and expectations, because um, the chief has said perhaps we should start to compile a list if we ever need to make a hire. Um, this could be the first charge mm -hmm. to say to this group, we'd like you to research how are police testing changes, how have recruiting strategies changes. Uh, for example, if you are a veteran, you get 10 points on the test. There's a movement to say we want to strategically hire women. You know, what is out there and what other municipalities are doing? Because civil service wouldn't do that, it would be a conflict. We'd ask this group to do that, share that research with us, and then we'd advise the civil service. So, but you, why do you say the civil service they, they should merely apply the rules rather yes. than right. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any other questions there? No, that's it. I, right. I think that's a perfect example of how useful this okay. this could be because we could move directly through civil service to begin making a list of you know potential officers we might hire, um, and that that could kind of 
start automatically if we want it. But this is a chance to step back, do some additional research, and really um, make sure that um, our hiring criteria align with the priorities of the council. And, and I, I guess I'd like to put some a particular spin on this that I, forgive me if it seems wrong. Um, it's really hard for municipalities to hire, right, hire police officers right now. And, that, and the police chief reported this to us. This is, a, this is a concern of his, that we would be caught flat-footed without a civil service list. Um, officers are, are leaving the profession, it's, and um, it's, it's a challenge for many places to hire, their, to, to even fulfill their needs, even for places like Lower Marion. I see this, this formation of this body as an opportunity to actually start to create a kind of police job that an officer would be really like born for. You know? yes. And that actually it could kind of make an art like a much kind of creating a really good type of environment and a good kind of job that a police officer would really want to come and do. I mean we see that Philadelphia former Philadelphia police officers always apply to our department because they like working here. But I think that there's a kind of other kind of people that might see see those opportunities mm -hmm. as, as enticing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Good question. Mm -hmm. All right, I see a lot of nodding here. So, what is our what's our next step? That's so, <clears throat> my understanding of our next step is the borough solicitor would craft a resolution along the lines of the um, memo that was provided to council, which would kind of formalize you know the chart, the you know the duties of this organization, the membership, you know membership terms, all that sort of thing. Um, so council wants, I can certainly talk to the solicitor about that and, you know, as soon as we can, um, I'll check, you know, how busy he is and as soon as we can, we can get an actual resolution the Board of Council for it. So this doesn't have to be an or done through ordinance? Uh, no. Because the EAC did. But. Right. Traditionally, committees that are done through ordinance are done so because they're explicitly defined in uh, borough code, state this, borough code. Yeah, that is yeah. a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, seeing no more discussion, I think uh, let's move ahead to pass this on to the solicitor. Okay. All right, thanks, Rob. Uh, That's yeah. city involved. That's a team that, uh, it's interesting. All right, uh, and our, our final presentation item, thank you for uh, waiting patiently, is a 714 Montgomery Ave. kind of sketch. Uh, do we have to set up anything? Or, uh, yeah, we, uh, Rob, sorry. Uh, Get uh, screen sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Let me uh, give you a co-host. And now uh, you should be able to screen share. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's correct. Yes, I'm going to offer you a laser pointer, but for some reason it doesn't show up on the screen. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, so we have the one laser pointer in the world that uh, doesn't show up on a TV screen. So. Okay, the, the mic is here, so just make sure you're speaking up. We've had some concerns from people uh, at home. So. Sure. No. Thanks. Uh, so I want to thank you for having me. Uh, Mike Friedman, um, uh, the owner of the Price House, we're developing. Um, we've submitted the tentative sketch plan, um, and so I'm here to you know, tell you about our plans for the property. Um, so I'm sure everyone's familiar with it, but we'll, uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, aerial site view. Uh, it's at the corner, of, or not on the corner, but uh, right at the meeting house and uh, uh, Montgomery Avenue. Um, and it's currently uh, where the price house sits, uh, built in 1803. Um, Etc. We can go and see the front and rear views uh, of what's existing today. Rob? I, I flipped it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so there's just like a, there's a second of lag here. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> it's a long lag. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the property. Um, most of the time you probably go by it in your car pretty fast, uh, so not everyone sees it when they drive by, but uh, it is between the uh, Bob's uh, service station and the old car crazy building that being turned over, I guess, uh, or in the process of being turned over. Uh, so this is the view from Montgomery, and we have a view, uh, excuse me, a uh, view from a meeting house as well. Just 
can ask you to speak up a little bit. I'm sure. I'm sorry. Folks at home. I mean, yeah, it's I'll okay. To hear, but I'll move a little closer. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so this is the view from Meeting House. Uh, this is the home of the old hamper shop from uh, like a hospital since uh, around 1950 or so. Um, they recently moved out. Uh, so um, uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar again. This is the back of the property. Uh, we'll go to the next. Anticipate this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Technology. Yeah. Wow. There we go. All right. So, uh, again, we submitted a tentative sketch plan. We received uh, comments back from Montgomery County. Uh, this is uh, copy and pasted from their uh, review letter. Um, uh, they support our proposal, uh, commend our satisfactorily addressing many of the concerns raised in the previous review. Um, we had moved, we, we, in a previous version of the plan, we had parking spots in front of the building on Montgomery Avenue. Uh, those were moved to the rear of the building uh, so that we sort of you know, can still see the house, the house better, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, the other thing, we shortened the, the connection between the existing building and the addition. That was something else that was uh, a request. Um, we got the Township Engineer review letter summary um, uh, comment one, or you know, one of one of the issues brought up was uh, the hallway gallery connecting to the trash area in the garage section. Um, so there's going to be a pathway that goes from the doorway into the garage area. The trash, it's probably more of a labeling thing that the, the trash can be tucked back in the corner and won't come into near where people will be walking. Um, details of the of the uh, commercial multi use of the existing building. Um, so we don't have specific details at this point, but it's anticipated that the existing use and office type uh, user will, uh, will uh, remain in the site. Uh, another comment was uh, at basically asking, is the driveway off of Montgomery Avenue now necessary? Um, and we, we believe it is necessary uh, due to the anticipated commercial use of, of the building. Um, again, if you have professional offices in there, you're going to want a Montgomery Avenue address and if people you know, put it into their navigation to go to your, you know, doctor's office or, uh, you know, lawyer office or whatever it may be. Um, they plug in 714 Montgomery Avenue and, you know, they're going to need a place to turn into the property. So we, we believe that we, we, uh, we do need it. Uh, they asked about changing the, uh, so we're keeping both existing driveways um, as, it, as it's been for uh, forever. Uh, so they asked about move, uh, the driveway meeting house is currently, the existing driveway is 18 feet wide. They asked about widening it to 24 feet, which we would be willing to do uh, if that doesn't trigger any other you know, code related issues. Um, and then their last comment was uh, regarding where the driveway, and you'll see when we get to the site plan, where the driveway off of Montgomery connects to the back of the building, um, questioning that it was uh, 11 feet from the first parking spot. So we'll make adjustments to that. Uh, so the plan going forward to move the driveway sort of away from that parking spot to address that. Um, we had the zoning uh, review letter, uh, which was uh, no, no issues other than uh, they brought up an, uh, the definition of a mixed use building as being a multi-story building intended to provide a vertical mix of uses. Uh, furthermore, 500-502H provides in relevant part, a mixed use building is a multiple story building that allows for a vertical mixing of uses. Additionally, 500-502H2, specific to mixed use building types, requires that residential uses are allowed on the second and third floors only. Based on the proposal, the uses are not only mixed horizontally and not vertically, but the rear portion of the structure has an extended portion of the residential use in the enlarged lobby and gymnasium on the first floor. This rear portion of the structure as currently situated would be defined as an apartment building and would be prohibited. Um, so we uh, don't believe that's true. Uh, we, our response is uh, below here, which is the proposal is for an addition to an existing building. So this is one building. You can't separate the rear and say there's, you know, that's an apartment building in the rear because it's, it's one, proposed to be one mixed use building, okay? Um, the first floor would have office in the front on Montgomery Avenue in the existing price house. Uh, the middle would be the connection with the parking area, and then the rear of the, of the uh, first floor would have the, um, 
residential lobby as well as a, a commercial gym. Uh, the second floor would then have office in the front in the existing price house, and then the rear portion of the second floor would have residential, and then the same thing on the third floor. Uh, so that's that. Uh, we did uh, have our planning commission meeting this week. Um, we did not uh, have the zoning officer review letter uh, prior to that meeting that was received after that meeting, so we did not have the benefit, neither, neither I or the planning commission had the benefit of uh, reviewing the zoning officer letter prior to that, but um, uh, in the planning commission letter, it was noted that the site is highly unusual, which we do agree with, um, mostly due to where, first of all, there is an existing building on the site, where it's situated on the site, as well as, as being a, a you know a, a historic um, building. So, um, so we do agree that that is an unusual site. Uh, benefits to the community, so. Obviously, the main one is pres preservation of the price house. Um, that's something that I am focused on. I've been talking to Kathleen from La Marine Historic Conservancy at length. I had her out to the property visit with me for over an hour. We walked inside, outside, and, and kind of looked at everything, and, and I heard everything she would like to see done. She heard everything I would like to see done. And, um, you know, we are, uh, you know, our, we're aligned with what we want to do here, basically. Um, part of the you know part of the development process, the sidewalks will be widened, which will promote activity and walkability along the Montgomery Avenue commercial corridor. Um, along those lines, street trees will be planted uh, to improve the streetscape along Montgomery Avenue commercial corridor, and we'll set an example for other property owners to follow. Um, so, one of the, I guess this past Sunday, we I, I went out with a group of people. Uh, Fred was actually there too. Um, uh, spent a couple hours walking up and down Montgomery Avenue, and it was, it was basically a combination of both Penn Valley Civic as well as uh, a group from Narberth again, including Fred and some, uh, some other people. Uh, we spent two hours walking up and down, and, and one of the main themes was making it better, and making it more walkable, and making it more you know active and, and community oriented. Um, and so, what it really needs is a property owner to go ahead and do it and, and get the ball rolling. Um, and so that's what that's one of the things that will be a benefit from this that I'm, I am trying to do. I, I live close by. I use the neighborhood. Um, I live right down the street, um, and it's something I would like to see done. So, um, and hopefully other people will follow and um, do all the things that we were discussing with the group last week. Um, the other thing I guess this is relevant for tonight: improve the stormwater management on site. <laughs> uh, uh, not there now, but. Uh, I would, you know, obviously there's no stormwater management systems in place on the site right now, which uh, yeah, as part of the development process, uh, you know, we'll put those systems in place to make the stormwater better. My car almost got flooded up front <laughs> right now, so I'm <laughs> personally interested in doing that right now. Um, uh, we'll also promote development and preservation in the newly created historic district. Um, so I know this is probably, this is one of, this is probably the first um, proposal come through with uh, that actually affects a historic building. Um, so I think this could be a, a good example of how to use the historic district to the borough's benefit to really promote development and preservation because that, that's really how these buildings get preserved. So um, here's uh, our proposed uh, site plan um, and a sketch plan. And, um, <laughs> got caught, caught in the flood. Yeah. Um, so here, this is the plan I submitted. Um, I don't know if everyone had a chance to um, take a look or review it yet, but um, I guess at this point, if there's any questions, happy to uh, go ahead and answer them. All right, thanks. Um, Barbara. You do have a question about um, when you were describing how you the uses. You said that. You know, the first floor in the price would have offices. You said something about the second, and then, the, and then it almost it made it sound to me like you're envisioning the, the connector to be three stories as well. Uh, because you were talking about how on the second floor, the price part would have offices, but then the other part would be residences. But I, 
I guess when I look at that, I think that that connector is just a one-story box. Yeah. So it doesn't feel to me like it's all one building. I don't know. It just doesn't feel that way to me. But that's I'm not I'm not a planning commission member. I'm not a zoning officer, but it just doesn't feel that way. So, so we received a copy of the Planning Commission recommendation today, and you didn't address their recommendation um, that you go for a variance or conditional use to allow multiple buildings on the lot. So we put a lot of faith in what the Planning Commission tells us, and yeah, that's sure. what they're recommending. So I'd love to hear you address that suggestion. Yeah, um, I, I did I did read that recommendation, um, and we did speak about that with the Planning Commission. Um, you know, the code does not allow for that, uh, the zoning code. Does not allow for that. Um, this is what the zoning code allows for, um, and so to recommend that we go through a process that we're not required to go through um, is appreciated. But at the same time, you know, it's not required, and it's a lengthy process that we at this point don't want to go through. Um, you know, we are willing to discuss that option, but you know, at this point, we feel we have a, a plan that's. Meets the zoning code. And well, that's not what our zoning officer says. Right. So. Right. And that's our that's our expert. So he says it's no good. Yeah, I, I understand. We we disagree with the um, the issue of, over the vertical mixing of uses. There's clearly vertical mixing of uses. I mean, there's a commercial gym right here, uh, and there's residential above it. That's the vertical. You know, one, two, three, gym, residential, residential. Uh, you know. We, we, we disagree with that comment. Yeah. So, so is the gym going to be a commercial business? Yes. So anybody could go to it, not just the rest. It will be for, it'll be a, like a retail space for lease. Okay. I thought they said it was very small for that purpose. So it, it, I mean, on this site plan, it's, uh, I think people said 200 square feet. Is that what's yeah, that, there? Yeah, the, the interior walls there do need to be adjusted. It'll end up being close to 400 square feet. I, I was looking a little bit on what the recommendations are for commercial gyms, and everyone was saying you need at least a thousand square feet to, to run a gym. So I, I question whether a viable commercial gym could could we could use that space. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, I'm not envisioning like a Planet Fitness here per se. Um, you know, it could be a personal training gym. I mean, there's there's many uses um, and people that you know, small businesses that would want to use that gym. There's bar classes. There's um, you know, yoga studio. I mean. I, I, I can think of a, a lot of uses for that space off the top of my head. Um, so I, I, you know, I appreciate what Google says about you know size of the gyms, but again, it's not Planet Fitness, and you know, I do think it is a usable space. Okay. Well, maybe let's let uh, since Todd Russi is here from the Planning Commission, uh, can you speak to the uh, the concern that? Uh, moving to a, a variance or a zoning hearing is somehow not allowed or is not appropriate for this property. I think that seemed to be what uh, the applicant was saying. Sure, thank you. Um, I've been telling myself not to forget this, if you don't mind, Council Member Rickards. I think I know that story of Arcelona you're talking about. Mm -hmm. that that's fun. Yeah, the purpose. Yeah, the purpose. <laughs> sure we uh, should go and research it. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to forget that. Uh, well, listen, I'm, I'm not a zoning lawyer uh, or a use lawyer, so I can't really pretend <laughs> that I am one. Um, I guess I'd first like to say this is a project that many of us would really like to get involved in. Uh, really like, I mean, you're going to speak up as a train yeah. And I couldn't hear you, so. <laughs> we would really like to get this project to Gold House. We really would. But um, our record in Norbert is that we, we really have to have a lot of back and forth and collaboration. And, and thankfully, it's begun. And I feel like um, this team has, has approached the feedback it's gotten in good spirit. Um, as the letter said, there's a couple of planning issues, and, there's a, and we believe, and, and, the, and the zoning officer believes, it's a couple of zoning issues, and they overlap, but sometimes they're separate. Planning issues are, we think that one side of the building is too close to the residential district. That's the major one. And there are minor ones, like the driveway. Um, but, but overall, I, I think the planning commission's feeling was this would just be great if it was an apartment building. And that um, a lot of what you see here may actually just be driven to meet the technicalities of the code. 
And I do respectfully disagree that a variance process is a process that you seek out when there are particularities of your site that prevent you from, from applying your code strictly. And, and we agree, there are some, there are some very um, major particularities of this site. One is the presence and the specific location of the price house it makes it very difficult to figure out how to configure something like this site. As you know, we've been working on workarounds for that, but it's focused on residential. <laughs> Area is not not this area. And the second particularity is it is a um, is a trapezoidal site. Zoning codes are written for rectangular sites, and it has two street frontages, but not a corner. Our code doesn't actually contemplate a building that would have two street frontages but not a corner. As you know, we're trying to fix that in in, in, in some ways. So there are a lot of particularities of this site that make it really hard to apply the zoning code. And it's exactly what a variance is for. When you, something about the nature of your site that you have not caught, you do not create a five site lot, they do not put the price house in. The variance is the way to get flexibility in the zoning <coughs> house, so you can work around those challenges. The second option is a uh, process by which you can put two buildings on a site. Um, it is correct, you would not be able to put an apartment building there. Um, you, because apartment building is not listed and not allowed in this area. But I'm, I'm thinking there must be some path that could be created if it was desired to have a separate apartment building and the price house that, that could be developed through a conditional use process and or variance or something like that. We, I mean, quite frankly, as you all know, um, when we see that an applicant has a reasonable case uh, for adjusting the zoning, we often propose zoning amendments. We did that right across the street for the uh, property that Adam Rosenbach developed. They came to us at the very beginning and said, here's our plan, but to accomplish this, we need a zoning change, which had to do with the size of buildings. And we looked at it and said, that makes perfect sense. Let's do it. So we have a lot of ways as a borough to accommodate situations where our code just doesn't fit. And I think the big challenge we have here is the code just doesn't fit. And we, we don't agree that we should just sort of look the other way and accept interpretations of the code that we don't really believe meet our planning goals, uh, and which could lead us to problems down the road in other situations. When, when there are other options available, a variance, a conditional use, or potentially even a zoning amendment. I think we would benefit greatly, as the applicant has said, for this site to be developed, for the price house to be preserved, would be, it would be a win for the whole community, and we want to get there. But we don't think approving this kind of sketch plan as, as a rate development is the path to right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Russell. Right. That, was, that was so helpful, I just think that was so helpful to hear because I've been really sitting here puzzling over this plan, and when you guys, and I've looked at it for a long time before you guys got up, and I kept expecting you guys to say, you know, we've got this price house and we're constrained and we've, we've got to use that in the way that the code prescribes. But what we'd really like to do is build an apartment building back here in this resident, adjacent to this residential neighborhood. But you didn't say, hey, we'd really just like to build an apartment building here. And I kept, you know, kind of looking at it and going like, why isn't this just an apartment building? And knowing that you're constrained by the zoning ordinance. And, and so I kept thinking, well, it's kind of like, it reminds me of like somebody who wants to be an actor, but they go and they get a job as a waiter. And in the daytime, they're a waiter, and at night, they try to be an actor. And, and it's like, a kind of, it's a very difficult, a difficult thing. Um, and so, like, you know, your, the constraint is your, your, your price house is like you're doing the waiter job. And the, you know, but really the site, you want to have an act, you, know, you want to at night be a residence. So, I, I guess I would encourage you to reconsider that recommendation of planning commission to to you know to consider applying for a variance. I think should, should the it's so, it seems kind of like evident, yeah. like that it could work. So yeah. The question I had was in, in lieu of the variance, right? Just everyone knows it. I believe everybody knows it's you know, the, the hardship piece, right? If, yeah. Know, if we do have a plan that complies with the code, and so creating a you know, you, you've met the burden to ask for the variance. <clears throat> Could the more appropriate 
method be an ordinance amendment, you know, as they talked about across the street, is that I think you, if that were the end goal, is I think you could actually craft an ordinance amendment that isn't necessarily specific to the site, but you could talk about a site that has two road frontages and things like that, that there's actually very few properties that it may actually impact, but it may actually achieve the goal. Um, and it may actually address other properties that have no problem. I think there's one other property in Norway that um, I love because I love <laughs> uh, I think there's one other property in all of Norway that that would even apply to. Well, there's, there's well, like Price and Montgomery where the audiology it's, places. It's, it's, uh, it's actually to um, Montgomery. Yeah, it's the office buildings on the, uh, across from Acme. They back on to um, Oh, yes. Uh, oh, right. But it does happen in several conditions along Montgomery. None. Oh, yeah, but they're a corner usually. Like the audiology place is on yeah, the corner. It's a corner. Uh, you know, Bob's station is on the corner. Um, all, it's, it's, it's not, I do acknowledge it's not. Okay. So. That's very cool. Oh, uh, yeah. So, in response to, um, to Rob's uh, suggestion, Rob, right? Yes. Sorry, uh, suggestion. Um, so, I think, you know, again, I think I'm excited for the potential of this area of the borough between what's going on at 650 Montgomery and what the um, developer here is proposing. Um, that being said, you know, when you point out that only a few properties would be affected by a possible zoning change, that's good in that you're right that it would limit the impact of it, but I would say it's bad in the sense that that's the definition of spot zoning, and that's generally considered a bad practice in municipal government. I mean, I would say that, and I, you know, I hate to, to make you have to jump, this is just me speaking, you know, just off the cuff here, but I hate that we have to jump through the hoop of getting a variance to the zoning hearing board. I understand that's going to add money and time and that sort of thing for you. But this is, in my opinion, the reason why the zoning hearing board exists is to deal with one-off situations like this. And I think the concern that I would see that I think other folks have kind of alluded to is that if we didn't do spot zoning, if we just accepted this as it is, it would unfortunately set a precedent for possible future mixed use development that doesn't have the, the hardship that I would, and, you know, I'm not the zoning officer, not a solicitor, but as an amateur, the perceived hardship this property has, other people in the future might try and take advantage of it to basically just build residential when the code calls for mixed use. Um, so I mean, my take is, I think this is, you know, really encouraging plan. And I think, you know, if we could just get that, that you know, that uh, issue from the zoning officer figured out, um, I think, you know, it could be some council to really talk a lot more about. But I do think the way to address that, that zoning issue is through the zoning hearing board. That's my kind of follow-up okay. question. Well, let, me, let me jump in briefly okay. about the, uh, the point about other buildings, because I've, I've also had this thought. So we have, there are areas like our downtown where we really want uh, people in and out. We want people to be coming into the ground floor of the buildings. And if we establish a precedent where something that could be considered like an amenity for an apartment complex is counted as a commercial use of the ground floor, then yeah, then we're going to see people developing apartment complexes with nice lobbies and nice ground floors. And we're not going to see the commercial flow of uh, people in and out that we're really looking for. So we. We have to be very careful about our definition of mixed use, and that's why I, you yeah. know, I don't feel this is fitting our, our definition. Yeah, if I, if I can just address what, that real quick, um, you know, there are two fronts here. Montgomery is the primary front, which that's the busy street. You no know, meeting house is a rear street, right? And so, you know, I, I don't know that you need the in and out on meeting house necessarily as much as you would want that on Montgomery. So I, I, think, I think we need to protect our definition of a mixed-use building, but I think I'm with everybody else that right. we don't necessarily need a mixed-use building in that lot. I mean, an apartment is probably more suitable there than it would be in the middle of downtown Norman. So right. that's that's what I was trying to make. Yeah, so, 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 right. so this, and I'm, I'm going to ask Todd, Todd chime in here if, this, if you can explain this. This site's really different than other sites because it has this, um, it has this historical building on it. And because you're required to retain the historical building, that that may be why you could qualify. 
that, that may contribute to the difficulty. And, and like, so even though you've been able to sort of satisfy technically, well, you haven't satisfied the zoning, actually. So you haven't satisfied, um, of, uh, you know, you maybe still have a hardship because the zoning, because the zoning officer that doesn't agree that this meets the, the code. But anyway, I'm just saying that I, I wonder about the HARB and whether or not that puts it into a different kind of um, discussion. Yeah, I just want to make sure we have our you know, semantics here, right, when we use the word, when everyone here uses the word hardship, that is something that is outside of the, it's a feature of the site that's outside the control of the property owner, is my kind of definition I work off of. And I guess the other thing I would offer for council's edification, as well as the applicant probably knows this already, is if we do come out of this situation where you do still feel that the zoning officer's interpretation is incorrect, um, I would offer that unfortunately, in this case from your perspective, the solution to that is to appeal to the zoning hearing board. Um, so I just want to make sure we were all on the same page about that. And that actually, Samantha, was my comment. I think as council, we just need to trust the process here. You know, I, I agree with the zoning officer and the Northern Planning Commission's interpretation of mixed use. I don't think it's our job to actually debate that here. Um, I, in fact, think we just say, okay, we are in support of the Northern Planning Commission and the zoning officer, and again, we are going to trust our own process and, and, and empower them to figure this out and use the tools that you just outlined um, to then later come back to us. But we can understand the reticence on the part of someone who wants to do a project to like realize, oh well, maybe, you know, the, the council still could oppose this application to the zoning hearing board, and so they might want to know what the council, what the how the council feels about it. Sure, I, I guess then if I'm speaking, I I feel as if the the zoning officer and the Northern Planning Commission have, you know, interpreted our code correctly, have our best interest, and I would like to then kind of hand it back to the Planning Commission uh, and say, let's get through that process. Um, so I think if I, if I actually understand maybe more of what Bob's chance. So for example, later, uh, at, immediately after this on the agenda, you know, a policy that I start with council is when, let's just say for whatever reason, if it does go to zoning hearing board, uh, council has the option of whether to, um, you know, because the zoning hearing board is a separate decision making body from borough council. Um, but borough council does have the option if they want to oppose an application to send the um, solicitor to it. Um, you know, the two we have coming up, I'm actually going to recommend against, you know, council doing that. And if I understand, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Bob, but maybe if what you're getting at is maybe if the developer could have some guidance from council if they go through the trouble one way or the other of going to the zoning hearing board that they're not wasting their time and money if sure. council yeah. does have other issues. council can it. also send the solicitor in support right. of, of their yeah. mm -hmm. and, 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 and sometimes that makes a difference. So that's why I was... Got it. Yeah. Well, Thank you. It seems like we're more likely to support the variance than this, interpret, this code interpretation. That's my feeling. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I, you know, I, you know, I, I enjoy our walk. I, I think you, you know, you have a good sense of the community, and, and uh, I think the the project, you know, in in a general form, uh, makes a lot of sense there. I think, you know, council is uh, it seems to be well disposed toward the idea of it. It's just this particular implementation, um, we feel does not. We agree with the. Uh, Interpretation of the zoning officer. Um. So, I mean, in terms of, of going forward for council, um, my understanding and, and the applicant and uh, Mr. Bessie might have a better sense of this is that with the 90 day application window for council to make a decision, um, you would have through your business meeting to make a, um, you know, a vote yes or no on the plan. Um, so, maybe my advice to the applicant and to council is to use that two week period here, maybe for you guys to decide, you know, which route you want to take with it. And then, um, you know, that the council have that information. Um, and maybe there's an opportunity, you know, in that time frame for you all to talk with the zoning officer and uh, coordinate with, you know, maybe Mr. Bressy as well. And, and, uh, and then though when council has to make a decision on the 21st, they'll be in the best position possible to do that. All right. Thank you for your 
your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah. Thank you all. And thank you for thank wanting you. to preserve the price house. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's, absolutely. That's the end goal here. So hopefully, yeah. we, uh, hopefully we can get there. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, stay safe on the road out there. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, my car's still there. Seriously. <laughs> all right. Uh, so next uh, items of business are two zoning hearing board applications. Yeah, but, yeah, I don't know if you, no, you don't have any role here for the zoning hearing board applications, do you? No. Uh, no. Okay. So I'm Thank you for your time as well. Yes. Thanks, Pat. The benefit of myself here, I'm just going to kind of skip down to uh, uh, those applications. So just a very quick summary for council. I, if you don't mind, council president, I'd like to just address them both at the same time. Unless, once if council has any objection, I want to hear them, please let me know. Uh, so the first one is for events. Uh, and, the, um, and the second application it is a conversion of a single family home to uh, accommodate an additional family. So go from a single family uh, to a two family dwelling. Um, everything I've heard from the zoning officer, from um, Michelle Carroll, the assistant to the manager, who's pretty heavily involved in these sort of things, none of the borough's professional staff have expressed any real concerns about these applications. And given that, I think as uh, as Councilmember Rickard said earlier, as Cindy said, I think we you know trust the process and trust our zoning hearing board on this. And so my recommendation is council. You know, take no action in support or opposition to either of these. So, so like, I just have one comment though. Like, I, I looked at both and I agree with you, like totally. In fact, the only the only thing that I think we need to be really careful about is like the fence is built already, and so this is a post facto. Um, oh, you know, this is like a ask for forgiveness yeah. later, yeah. and like. Frankly, it's gorgeous. It's a beautiful fence. Like it's the reason I kind of thought the fencing ordinance was a little, you know, like maybe didn't allow for enough freedom of expression. But anyway, I, but, but I do think like this thing where people are doing something and asking for this mm -hmm. later, like you know, I don't know. It, it just kind of doesn't. It's costing them money. Yeah, I guess so. That's the punishment. Mm -hmm. Well, if they asked in advance, they have to pay them. Too, I guess, right? Yeah. Well, it's just the permit's cheaper than the zoning here. You know, I don't know. That's just what is the permit is cheaper than the zoning here for. Yeah, but the permit would have uh, violated the 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 zone. It was yeah. an exception. They would have had the trip. Trip. Well, also my understanding with the borough D schedule nowadays is that when you get if you get called doing something without a permit, you have to pay a double permit fee as Ooh, well. Wow. Oh, so they built it. With, I'm sorry, as a question, oh, really? they built it without a permit. Well, yeah. They, well, my understanding is that because it wouldn't have if it had been if it had been built with, with a permit, then the zoning officer would have flagged it as need to go to the zoning hearing board so, before it got built. So, so can we just kind of food. So we can just can we just I mean I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure enough that's not but my understanding be if it's in zoning hearing board after it got built then it must have been built without a permit because otherwise it would have been. Okay. Can we just confirm that they had to pay the double permit? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. That's, yeah. I, I think yeah. If they haven't. They should. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, I totally agree. Thanks for pointing putting that out, Bob. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know. That and that no, the other, really just the other comment is the two family thing. That's really just an outflow of like the new zoning that we wanted to enable, enable that to happen. Mm -hmm. And so this is like actually a normal process for enabling a-, a They might be asking an advance. An exception. No, they are. Oh, they are. Yeah. 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 a special exception is like just, that's a normal They know they need a That's following the Tear and go half a I did have one question about that though, just out of curiosity for myself. I, I looked up when that house was built and it was built in 1910. So it's under the historic district. Does, does the heart have anything to do with this when you're adding on? This is what I was like, oh, I can't remember now. If you're adding on, I don't think it matters. That's the right. what lot layer it's in or something. Well, right. in yeah. general. And, and this is like on the side, so that's where I was like. Mm -hmm. In general, when you're adding on, um, I don't want to say every time, but most of the time when you're adding on, then the harb is not involved. That's my problem. They are, they are taking stuff down, but it's in the third lot layer, which is that's not covered by the, by the historic well, district. I didn't know. 
Okay. I, I think all of the I all the removals and all of the additions are in the third but, library. And I thought the old part was something that wasn't as old as the original, but I could be wrong. I kind of looked it looked that way to me, but I'm. I'm uh, nonetheless, I think yeah. the location of it yes. is that it's, it's not correct. I just was curious. But was presumably, they kind of took a look at it. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I figured, but I was I was curious. And I actually think if we could just underscore it, this is a great example of historical preservation doing exactly what we right. wanted. Exactly. And one of the concerns were people were like, I can't build an addition to house my... No, you can. This is an example of, yes, yes you absolutely can. can. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So we should all kind of refer to this property. Yeah. All right, so I'm not hearing any uh, desire for council to intervene in either of these. Nope. Yep. Okay. Uh, two action items. Uh, first action item is um, resignation of John Arco from the Police Pension Committee. Uh, so we just need to make a motion. Make a motion. All right. Well, let's let's. Uh, can, can wait a moment. Go. Ahead. Uh, Okay. okay, well, we need, we need a motion to uh, accept a resignation of John Arco from the Police Pension Committee. I can make that um, I move that Council accept the resignation of John Arco from the Police Pension Committee. Second. There's a second. Any discussion? All, right, all those in favor of accepting the resignation? I'm going to say thank you to John for his service. Yeah. Yes, thank you. We appreciate your service. <laughs> My apologies for the interruption. Uh, so I wanted to ask council, and I wasn't sure whether to talk about it during this action item or not. Um, I wanted some guidance from council in terms of how to fill that vacancy, as well as we have a vacancy, unfortunately, on um, uh, NIDA um, due to the passing of uh, uh, Andy Hawkinson. And so I didn't know, because we haven't had a chance to really we would started talking about our, you know, volunteer application process. But we haven't had a chance to finish that out, so I want guidance from council on how you all want to fill those vacancies. I mean, I just envision, um, you know, we'll post on the website, the email, Facebook that, you know, by this date, we need applications in for these two vacancies, mm -hmm. and that I know the volunteer application form has not been officially blessed by FNA and, and council, and there are some legitimate uh, concerns about it from members of FNA. Um, but I do think that form is better than the no form at the moment. Yeah. And so even an imperfect form, yeah, I'd like to move forward with it. When is that, when are you gonna discuss that form uh, in FNA? We're not meeting this month. I mean, we, we kind of approved it, and I have to say. Um, well, we got some later uh, feedback on it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that won't be ready until, uh, until like our June meeting then. Uh, till May, yeah. yeah. Well, you're yes. going to meet before, you're, you meet after our business meeting in May, right? So it'll be June right before. before. We meet right before. Right before it. Yeah, right before. So we can, in theory, approve it in the, at the May meeting. Do we just want to put this off a month? But we should advertise these I, positions. I think we should advertise, yeah. Okay. I mean, look, look at the way we used to do it, you know? And I would say for these two committees, actually, are probably the most unique. And you really are looking for a professional skill set, uh, kind of uniquely, mm -hmm. I would say, in both the you know the pension and NIDA. So I think we're probably going to have a smaller qualified group of volunteers. So putting they're not going to be like beating your doors down to apply to either of these committees. No, and, and this is not a test case where we would expect anyone from the public to regularly attend the police pension committee meetings. <laughs> True. Yeah. Or yeah. even night. Okay. Or so, yeah. so you're suggesting that we don't need any formal application, mm -hmm. but we can trust uh, okay. sort of we'll get a professional resume probably. Yeah. yeah that we'll, makes sense. Um, you yeah. can just do it the way you used to. You know. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. Yeah, and there there was a little blur written up about both of those from the past. Yeah. I'm not sure if I have any of those still, but. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think the, the proposal is to put it up sort of as soon as we uh, the way you acknowledge the, uh, the resignation, well, as soon as we acknowledge this resignation and to do it slightly informally, you know, using the procedures we've done in the past. Yeah, so what we'll do then is, um, you know, as not tomorrow, but um, by the 15th, we'll have it uh, put out there. Um, maybe we'll set a deadline for applications for, um, you know, for like the, you know, the six probably, and then council can make an appointment decision on the on May nineteenth. 
Okay. I will say in both cases, um, um, doing that will yield zero applicants. So we, we probably need to do a little bit of, uh, of uh, Direct, uh, uh, recruiting. Well, nonetheless, we need to post these publicly yeah. as well. No, I, I can't understand yeah. that. I'm just saying that's that's necessary but not sufficient. Okay. All right. <laughs> you volunteered. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm doing neither. I wouldn't even know where to begin on the other one. Police pension fund? Yeah. No. Well, I mean, we can also ask the current trustees. Yeah. 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 That's what I was going to say. Yeah. 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 And I do believe in the police pension fund. Correct me if you're wrong. You don't have to be an Arbeth resident for that one, right? Can't there be one person that's not an Arbeth resident? I'm not sure about that. That's a good question. I apologize that I don't know that yeah. off the top of my head. Okay. I actually believe one, of our, right about that. one of our former pension committees actually looked outside of the borough. Okay. Is Adam on that? All right. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like we have a plan to proceed here. So we had a, a motion on the floor mm -hmm. and a second. Uh, so, all those in favor of accepting the resignation of John Arco from the Police Pension Committee. Uh, it's unanimous. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Arco. Uh, next action item is the consideration of approval of the 201 Save I Lease Extension. Uh, Glenda Dixon. Samantha. Anna. Thank you, uh, Fred. So, um, oh yeah, before council, I think it's pretty straightforward. It's an extension of the um, lease that we've had uh, most recently with uh, Leonard Dixon. Thankfully, they're doing you know well at two one Sabine and want to stay there. Uh, as noted under the rental terms, uh, the annual rent owed for each year will increase uh, in proportion to the consumer price index for this area. Um, so there is an inflation-based rental increase each year. Uh, it's for a total of um, you know, three years. And um, as usual for our leases, you know, the borough does have a um, right of recapture on it. So I'd certainly recommend in favor of it. Um, welcome to council's thoughts on it. Okay, uh, does anyone have comments on the lease extension? We don't have to go looking for a new tenant. <laughs> okay. It seems like the council was in favor to, to uh, approve this resolution. Um, right. A motion will be great. Please, thank you. I'll now entertain a motion to approve this lease extension. I move the borough council approve the uh, 201 say by lease extension with Leonard Dixon. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving the 201 say by lease extension with Leonard Dixon? Yeah. All right, uh, let's move on to committee reports. Uh, infrastructure. So um, I have, um, Michelle is not able to be here uh, tonight, and so I'm just going to read the report that she submitted to me, which is that there was no meeting in March. Um, the next meeting is April 26th, where we will be reviewing Parks and Rec's recommendations on skate park uh, operating rules. We'll be discussing the skate park pilot grand opening, which we're hoping will be by Memorial Day at the latest. And then um, just a reminder about the uh, town square design uh, charrette. Um, and then uh, I believe uh, Samantha has uh, uh, some more details on that or so on. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think uh, I forget what we've talked about publicly before or not, but um, you know, the borough is working on a project for our planning commission for our comprehensive plan to re-envision uh, the area formerly known as Station Circle that we are now referring to as Town Square. Um, we had a great meeting this morning with some of the possible uh, applicants to be the designer as part of that. And we have some uh, public meetings coming up. Uh, they're basically going to be uh, on Wednesdays for the next uh, few weeks here on April 20th, uh, May 4th, and May 18th uh, to talk through the design process. Uh, I certainly you know, strongly encourage any interested residents to come to April 20th. I will be here at the uh, borough office. And you know, it's going to be really important to get resident feedback on this because ultimately we want whatever we do to work for the residents. That's the whole point of this redesign. So, um, 
Yeah, I certainly, and for anyone who can attend in person, the meeting will not be live streamed, but it will be recorded. So if anyone wants to watch the recording afterwards, you can't make it, and then provide some comments or thoughts, you can certainly welcome back to. So to Anything else from infrastructure? No. Okay. Uh, finance administration. Um, sure. So we did not meet in March because I was traveling for business, and we won't do that. We will not meet again in April because I will also be traveling in another time zone. Uh, I did meet with Samantha Borough Manager to discuss was there anything pressing that FNA had to discuss um, in April, and she and I both felt that there was not that could be handled. Um, at the council meeting, so just let the public know. Um, a couple tidbits. This was not discussed in FNA, but it is um, two questions that have come up yet repeatedly um, that are timely because it's tax season. Um, so I did want to give Samantha um, some time to respond. I, we got another inquiry about if I continue to work remotely, do I pay taxes to NARA? Uh, if you remember, we discussed this in 2020 and decided, no, we did not. Uh, for two years, a couple of accountants have said, no, you have to. If you're not paying Philadelphia, for example, and you are working remotely at home, you should be paying taxes to NARVA. So because I got two of those inquiries, I checked again with Samantha, uh, and the answer continues to be, our interpretation continues to be, no. You do not. Which tax? So I like Which tax would you pay? Well, I think there might be a little more nuance than, than that sort of thing. Sure. I'm sorry about I, it. No, I mean, I just wanted to provide an example because I, like, I work in my home. I certainly have a zoning, you know, I have a zoned office, but there are many therapists who have given up their brick and mortar offices in the city, they've given them up in Arnold, they've given them up wherever, and they've moved back into their homes. And they're not planning to go back to their offices. Like this is just their new way of life, and they're having and they're doing business the same way I'm doing business. I'm paying taxes. Other as other residents are paying taxes. Those people, I believe, should be required to have a business privilege license and, and kick in. It's not it's not a huge tax bill. So that's a, a different business. example, actually. And yeah, that's why I said it might be. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That's the part two to this part. Um, so I. Uh, so maybe you go ahead and maybe mention part two, and then maybe I could try and address both at the same time, because I think they might be interconnected. Okay, so the example for part one, let's say, so I work at Drexel, and we now say I'm only on campus 20% of the time, and they adjust, so I only pay 20% of that city wage check. Mm -hmm. There are some accountants that have told people that, okay, that 80% of the time that you're working remotely at your home, you still have to pay those taxes then to your home. Which tax? Yeah. We, don't well, wage tax. we don't have a wage tax. We don't have. Tax. I agree. That's so that accountant just says so zero. No I think the accountant that's that's giving you eighty percent deduction on your city wage tax is wrong. No, no, because no, if you're an employee of a school that exists oh, in Philadelphia, no, 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 Bob, that, no, no, that, that, no, that is really correct. Uh, is correct. Actually, uh, yeah. if I were lived in the city of Philadelphia, that would be your take. All right. So it sounds oh, okay. like okay. So it sounds like there the two issues are both with earned income tax and business privilege tax, and who is paying them and should be if they're working from home here in Narver. Right. I'll try not to get too wonky here, yeah. um, but just for full disclosure for the public, council knows this because you interviewed me, but. My first real municipal job was actually doing the collect, part of my job was collecting business privilege, the equivalent business privilege taxes for a large town in South Carolina. Um, and I've had an opportunity to read the business privilege tax law uh, here in Narberth Borough. And, um, and I am familiar with the state CIT law and have had to do a lot of research in the past on that. So starting first with earned income tax, so Narber, I'm certainly not advocating tonight or anything. I don't have a position for or against Narber Borough having an earned income tax. Narber Borough is somewhat unusual, in my opinion, in not having an earned income tax. And because of that, the way earned income tax usually works, and again, I swear I'm going to try not to get too much in the weeds here, is that you pay it, if there is one in your municipality where you live, you usually pay it to the municipality that you live in, no matter where you work. If you're the municipality that you live in doesn't have one, 
then you usually pay it to the municipality instead that you work in. Now, Philly is actually its own category and that Philly was given an exemption in state law back during the Great Depression to where if you work in Philly, it doesn't matter where you live, whether they have an earned income tax or not, Philly gets all of that earned income tax money. Mm -hmm. um, so, someone, if someone is working in Philly, or I'm sorry, if someone is you know, working partly in Philly and working partly in Narbor, then in my opinion, all of their earned income tax should be getting paid to the city of Philadelphia. Um, if someone is, you know, had prior to this had been working in, you know, Philly and now 100% is working from home, I don't know the city of Philadelphia is fully IT law, but, you know, you certainly wouldn't owe anything to Narbor for, uh, you may or may not owe any money to the city of Philadelphia in that case. Um, sorry, is that a question or just? Uh, I mean, finish okay. your, finish, but uh, so then, I, have, I have to contradict you, but you can finish. Uh, we've had experience with this. Philadelphia had a, had a it, it is indeed the case that if you are working at home and you are not working in Philly, that the portion of time you're working at home, you're not paying that tax. That uh, yeah. And your, your employer yeah. by now should have adjusted for it. Yeah. There was a grace period like a year ago to apply for a rebate. So we got a rebate from Philly yeah. for the portion of time and my wife was working at home. Yeah. So, yeah, but, that's but the point is your employer should be dealing with that. That yes. is something your employer should yes. have handled by now. It's, it's, not entirely, it's not entirely true for all employers. My employer has told us that we are working uh, outside of Philadelphia by choice, and they're taking all four percent, all four point two percent. So the end, the end result. Yeah, as, as, as far as, 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 that's how I as, as, as yeah. far as the borough of Narber goes, Narber yeah. Borough does not have an earned income tax. Right. So whoever you're sending your earned income tax money to, none of it should be coming to us. Got it. Okay. Um, and then the second part, business privilege tax. So business privilege tax applies to businesses. There's a, you know, there's a slew of um, exemptions in the business privilege tax. And one of those things is if you receive a wage or salary from a company, you're not paying business privilege tax. So it's, if you are a sole proprietor, then obviously then you are, you know, you are a business. And, um, you know, if, you're, if you have a business in the borough of Marber, whether it's brick and mortar or home base, you should be remitting business privilege taxes to the borough. Um, as Bob pointed out, and in my opinion, I would agree, it's a fairly nominal amount of money. It's 0.015% of your gross revenue uh, here in the borough of Narber. Um, so it's, you know, a little more than a tenth of a percentage point. I think it's very important to mention that not only if you have a business, but if you take rent, Yes, that take, as well. If you take rent rental payments, payments that you report yeah. on a Schedule E of a 1040, those are taxable by NARBOR at the rate of 0.015%. And I guess if someone would right. make that sure that that was made really clear as well. And it would be nice if this could get pushed out mm -hmm. in some way. Well, it is. So as a result of your question on that, because that is, I think, the really important part, too, of this, is that there are folks that now should be paying a business privilege yeah. checks because they have moved to, to exactly the scenario you're saying. So Michelle Carroll actually is creating a flyer in uh, response to the email that you sent. Okay. This yeah. just happened. And even if you rent a room, room in your house, you do. You, uh, you're uh, let me just back up for a um, uh, Did someone from council ask her to do that? No, she offered. I have to go back and look at the no, email. I asked, I asked, here's what happened. I wrote to Cindy, the chair of FNA, and I suggested that the FNA decide if they want to do some. I made that suggestion to the FNA committee, and then for some reason um, Michelle chimed in and volunteered, and I didn't respond to that. I said I was really like, it's up to Cindy. I said I called to be a stink bug. Cindy, it's, it's up to the it's up to the borough manager. I called to be a stink bug in a public meeting, but I do want to emphasize to council that anything that goes to borough staff, I should you know be sure. included on. You know what? And I thought you were on here. I'm saying it was it did come. No, no, you know no, what? It it's just Michelle Carroll. That's why I'll forward it to you now. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm glad that information is getting out there. And the you know thing I would say is we use a third party to collect our business privilege tax. They're obviously given the amount of money we're talking here. I wouldn't expect them to like go hunting on Google or something no. to see who's doing stuff here. But I would encourage the public or members of council 
you know, if you have a question about your own business, I encourage you to reach out to the borough or a third party collector. Um, and, you know, I don't necessarily encourage snitching, but, you know, I mean, if someone is concerned about whether a business is following the right regulations and that sort of thing, and you report it to the office, you know, then that's something we would certainly take seriously and, and look into. And then why don't we add on the FNA agenda? I'm sorry, Smith, I thought you were CC'd on that. A, a kind of public service announcement to folks that say you may not realize, but hey, you have to register, this is how to do it. And, and I'm not even sure that has to go through FNA because that's something that um, I can just touch base with the office on. Yeah, I, mean, I think, yeah, I think we can. I think, uh, I think working with the office can work if you can get something out Perfect. there. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And I would think that in that you would have a little thing like, you know, this doesn't apply to you if you are getting paid wages by somebody else. <laughs> right. So, and then that takes care of the, oh, if you're getting, if you're right. getting rental income, then you are paying business for these tax. If you're yeah. paying yourself, you get it. You know. yeah. Who it applies to, who it doesn't. Right, exactly. And I think that, that, and then hopefully somebody can show it to these accountants and say, go away. <laughs> and I, I do want to add one last point just to give, I think we might have publicly mentioned this at the last meeting, um, but just to emphasize again, the borough office has been taking more proactive steps to ensure uh, accurate business privilege tax collection. Uh, most notably, all contractors doing work in the borough, whenever we get a building permit application or a zoning permit application, they have to file, register for business privilege tax. And if they're doing well on behalf of a, a commercial entity, then you know we check to make sure that uh, entity is you know has a business privilege license. And um, once we start doing our rental inspections, uh, we'll also be checking to ensure that those folks are um, paying the business privilege tax on those rentals. Great. Um, the next is council has the bonus matrix that you'll discuss at the next business meeting in executive session. Um, you have that draft. I'd like to get that to the borough manager as soon as possible after you all have an opportunity to workshop that. Has it been sent around to council at this point? It should have, you should have gotten it in touch probably two weeks ago. Oh, this thing you should, okay, the draft. Yeah. Uh, after FNA workshop, I sent it out to I thought it was new. Um, Sorry. Uh, the next thing that you'll also get is the Norwood Planning Commission had an opportunity to think about our list of that 5A zoning. Um, and you'll get that next mm -hmm. at the business meeting. Mm -hmm. Just if they have any comments. I've not heard about their meeting on Monday, if they had any additions or questions for us, but you'll have that for review at the next business meeting. Um, we'll need to advertise that. Um, the next is um, there is a grant in draft to apply for those COVID funds that identifies um, the vulnerable population of our small downtown businesses. It is still in draft form. It's going to multiple different stakeholders for eyes and inputs. Um, and then the manager and I will look back um, to see about that submission in the coming weeks. That's all I have for FNN. So it was actually at the planning commission meeting. No, it's okay. okay. All right. So they had a concern. They, they were wondering if we wanted to include uh, some distance limitations on the adult uses, mm -hmm. uh, in particular to say they can't be within X number of feet of a daycare center, mm -hmm. a church, mm -hmm. uh, a school. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the problem, we might have to look at the map and see if if we can come up with a number or if you know, our roof is so small, yeah, right. if we put in too much meeting. of a distance, because there's the Friends Meeting House at one end and Sabine at the other, and if we, right. if we make the limits too high, then there's no place that you can put a, a business, which then we is not allowed. Yeah, okay. Right, so we have, we have to make sure that any number we create still allows for uh, a spot to be, yeah. to be used for this. Yeah. So, yeah. Sure. It's a little okay. tricky. Anyway, that was the, the upshot of their discussion. Yeah. We'll get okay, great. Later. And I think that we should let them workshop that because that is really um, in the weeds. No, they're, they're throwing it to us. It's, it's, it's going to be no. our decision. They, okay. don't wanna, they don't want to They don't want to make that decision. No, it's, they have a lot on their plate. I think that we can probably do that the next okay. meeting. Um, and then the next is just a friendly reminder and out um, to the public is that May 6th, for the first Friday in our art month will also be our council open house. Um, and we are posting that comprehensive plan review on the webpage just because it is grant season and it's just, and the, we have so much going on. We're, so please take a look at that and then come see us at our art month the first Friday in May 6th. That's all. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Cindy. Do, do you want to see more bonus? Oh, sure. Just like yeah. Uh, public health and safety. Okay, so so public health and safety met the first Friday of April, and we meet next on May 6th. Um, so 
We reviewed the Sabine Avenue uh, recommendations from the traffic engineer. We have a long-standing uh, request um, to attend to the signage on Sabine. And so the committee did support the recommendation from the traffic engineer, uh, which includes um, adding some additional signage at the exit of the driveway from uh, Sabine. Um, and um, we are also, I guess, going to look into, is that right, the parking? Yeah, I think um, the, um, I think I've asked the um, parking committee, the other thing that traffic engineer recommended was allowing parking on both sides of Sabine to also deter um, one-way traffic, wrong-way traffic on it. Um, and so that's, I, I think, public health and safety thought was more appropriate for the parking committee to take up and address. Mm -hmm. So, Barbara, is that something we could add? Certainly. Yeah, okay. Um, and we have that we have that report from the traffic engineer we could send to Harvard. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. be, yeah, yeah we'll definitely send that. This, this is news to me, so thank you. Okay, so uh, we also discussed um, kind of right-sizing the TCDI grant application to bring it under a $100,000 uh, threshold, mm -hmm. by memory, right? Because we were advised that that would be a more competitive kind of size grant for this round. Um, and we are going to use our tracker counting technology, I think next on North Market Avenue. And that is we'll, correct. And yeah. then we'll work through the list of traffic complaints using the counters to collect data. Um, so also we discussed the civil service list. This was the request from the police chief. We alluded to this a little bit earlier. And then we discussed the um, the uh, advisory uh, committee. So I think we've kind of already discussed all that. Now that the committee is moving forward in the form of a, a resolution, right, for us to consider. From I, our expectation is that if it is approved, then the first charge could be, um, as Cindy had discussed, you know, what are the criteria. Um, that we use in making that list. Uh, we also supported an Arbor Day uh, resolution uh, that came from Shade Tree. And I believe Shade Tree is going to ask our committee to review some of the ordinances related to tree planting and maintenance uh, at our next meeting in May. Um, and then uh, also in May, we will be checking in on the Climate Action Plan to kind of mark our uh, progress and um, clarify our priorities, you know, um, moving forward. Um, I know that we have uh, been making progress, thanks to our manager, on additional EV chargers in uh, residential neighborhoods that would um, be more convenient for uh, homeowners, especially without driveways, to charge overnight. Uh, at a location that could be really close, you know, to where they live, and so it could make it that much more convenient and doable to switch to an electric car. All right, and those uh, those traffic suggestions are those going to just be adopted? Or are they going to flow to the uh, consent agenda? What's going to be the procedure for? So I felt that unless council had an objection for the signage, so we would just. Do it, okay. and uh, I'll, yeah, and the, uh, if there's any change in parking, then yes, council would have to amend the parking ordinance to allow for that. All right. Great. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, and have parking. Okay. Um, we met last on March 8th. Um, we will be um, taking another look at the uh, municipal parking lot ordinance because the one that we had for the was at the March 17th business meeting. We hadn't had a chance to fully look at um, some of the adjustments that have been made, and so we need to take a look at that because some of that wasn't quite what we had intended. So we hope to have that for council to consider at the April business meeting, because we will be meeting again on April 12th, so next Tuesday. Um, we're continuing to work on the residential parking, and our goal continues to be to have a plan for council to consider at the May workshop meeting. 
And um, our next parking committee meeting is April 12th at 8 a.m. And we'll be meeting at 8 a.m. Uh, the second and fourth, second and fourth Tuesdays in April and May. And how much further past that we go, we'll see. But that's our time right now for those two months. So you can wrap everything up in two meetings? No, not no. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not promising that. But I just okay. I'm saying we haven't. We, I, we've been we've been moving the time of our meeting. Um, sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's nine. Right now, we just know for sure it's eight April and May. Uh -huh. And then <laughs> more months past that we're going to go, we'll let you know what the time frame is for that. All right. Yeah. But <laughs> no, no, no. We're no, because there's yeah. We still have commercial parking to talk about. That's probably fine. It's yeah, no, we've got a lot of time. Sorry, I don't sorry, understand, I, don't understand I, what you're saying. That, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I got it. <laughs> I just I'm not gonna. I'm not going to say how many more months are going to be at eight, whether, whether you know, yeah. All right, thank you. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, are there any announcements for the good of council? Just have one. So um, I've been uh, serving at council for now uh, just about three months, and I just want to let you all know how much uh, I've really enjoyed working with all of you. It's been a real pleasure. You think you're going to ask for a raise? <laughs> Three times the same. Good for that man. Yeah, really. Thank you. Just to be clear for the public, council is unpaid. It's a volunteer <laughs> position. <laughs> that's the so, that's the joke. That's why it's funny. Yes. Yeah. All um, right. And actually, I have an announcement as well, if I may. Um, so I just want to reiterate, since this is our usual meeting time, for anyone who missed the emails or the announcements or anything, um, borough council didn't meet on Tuesday night for a special meeting to meet a grant deadline. Uh, Borough Council did approve moving forward on a grant application uh, to acquire the three um, or por a portion of the three Elmwood property. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will find out in November about that grant. Uh, and the total grant, as was mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, is 1.1 million. The total acquisition price, I'm sorry, is 1.1 million. And the grant would pay half of that uh, if awarded, and then the borough would need to come up with the other half of that acquisition price. Um, so I just want to make sure we mention that during our uh, usually scheduled public meeting tonight. Thanks. And uh, I don't believe we have uh, an executive session scheduled for tonight, so uh, I'll take the motion to adjourn. Can I ask a question oh, for the council? Can we discuss at the next meeting? Are, are we moving to one meeting? Change July, August? Usually, don't we normally do that? July, August. Is that June? Okay. Yeah. Is that feasible? July, August. Don't we do that? Yes. July, August. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it at the next meeting. Okay. Yes. That's all I wanted to put up. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I'll, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I regret it. All right. All those in favor of adjournment? All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.